All right, let me know if it comes up because it says that it's live. Oh, yep, it says it's streaming now. Let me view it live. Uh, yeah, it looks like we're live right now. Hello, Internet. Hello. I'm going to trust you, Jonah, with the stream because I unfortunately have to kind of keep an eye on the actual backside of things because of the Zoom issues we've been having. Yeah, no worries, man. I will keep my eyes on the actual Twitch screen. Uh, but our viewers don't need to worry about that. Hello, kind citizens, and welcome to World Salad, your bi-weekly world-building uh, RPG show. Yep. Um, Jonah, I know it's been a while since you've been on, but what have you been up to? How have things been going with you? It's been a hot minute. Uh, I mean, boring answer, work's been kind of crazy lately, but that's just how it is. On more fun topics, I've kind of been experiencing almost a renaissance in my RPG uh, hobby. Like, my my normal group is, you know, we, we're sticking to a every two-week schedule, which is actually exciting, so we're getting to play. Uh, I'm starting playing in another game tomorrow night with some friends from high school, so that's always going to be fun. Knowing those guys, we're only going to get, like, you know, a handful of sessions in, but still, like, I'm happy to play again. Yeah, no, it's, it's cool that you're able to start it back up again. It's always hard to, like... Um when you don't know exactly what's going to happen. Um, like, for me personally, part of my thing has been, I've been desperate to try to get played again, and I was trying to run something on Wednesdays, but I'll be honest with you, I was kind of just not... I mean, like, work's been kind of tough, so mm -hmm. I've been having difficulty kind of maintaining the energy for it. And I think part of the issue, too, is that um, some of the people who it came in with had certain ideas of what they wanted to get out of it, but then kind of changed once we started. So then the downside of that is like, all right, the entire dynamic just got flipped on its head because I was specifically building things for one direction, and now it's all for something else. So it's like that's, you know, not um, not great when stuff like that happens, you know? Yeah, so not to get too sidetracked, but you, like, when you're saying that some players had a different idea for the direction stuff was going in, uh, talk, talk more about that. Like, what... what what happened there to cause that disconnect? Well, like, essentially what happened was um, I was working on... Well, like, so I came up with a setting, and I didn't really have, like, a larger story planned in mind. I kind of figured, like, oh, I'll just drop these guys somewhere, and I'll kind of, like, have them... You know, just kind of figure out what they want to do from there. I'll give them some options and some places they can go. Um, and then one character is like, oh, I want to be, like, a ninja who's going to challenge this... Uh, you know, he's looking for a worthy combatant. And so he's, like, looking for, I, I kind of say, all right, yeah, there's this, this tough group, and they're kind of, like, some of the big guys around. So maybe one of the things you might want to do is see if you can take them on. And, and they're like, all right, cool. And then, like, session two, he's like, yeah, I think I want to, like, I want to play another character who's completely different than that guy. And it's like, the first chance he got to kill him, he basically dove for it. Yikes. I mean, that could happen. It's not ideal, though, especially when it's like, all right, well, I was kind of planning one direction, and then now that thing's kind of pivoted, like, now I have to kind of, like, pull it back from there and kind of figure out something on the fly. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of coming up with something, but the downside is is it kind of got it got sidelined by holidays. You know, like, we had Christmas, and then we had New Year's, and then right after that was all the stuff that happened in Washington. So people were like, yeah, I don't know if yeah. I feel like playing tonight, so... Um, yeah, it's been it's been a very rough time to really get into a game, uh, you know. So the fact that anyone's playing at all is always is always good. What's with the and stuff on your back so, wall, so, by the way? What was that? What's with the stuff on the back wall? The CMs. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm in uh, the office slash art room in my house. Uh, the way my desk is situated, it faces Carly's side of the room, and okay. she, being a person who enjoys fun, likes to have decals on the wall. No, I'm, I'm so, fine with that. The reason why I ask is because I got a friend of mine who, uh, he's having his first kid, um, so it's one of those things of like, that looks awful like, like a nursery. It's like, is there something that I don't know about, Jonah? No, no, I promise you, there's no kids on the way. Just one of the people who lives here has a childlike sense of wonder and joy. 
I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, you know? Like, no, no, thank God she has it, because if it was up to me, this house would look drab and terrible. So, actually, the one thing is, I'm starting up on a, on a, so that campaign that I was running, my friend Dan wants to do something instead, and we're going back to Eberron. He was running something okay. briefly for a while, but it kind of fell through, and now, you know, we're going to be going into that. And no, I mean, like I've been dying to play, and it's 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 difficult. And like you said, you'd think that like with people being more connected, I guess part of it is is I'd like to play with people that I know. I'm not against yeah. playing with strangers, but there's one thing to be like I want to play with people who I know I'm comfortable with, but a lot of them just like I don't know what they're up to, or they they're not really vocal with their plans, or they're not available. So it's like, okay, people who I would play with, I have no idea when they're even in, up for it or if they're even interested. And other mm -hmm. people who I do know are like, yeah, I really want to play in person, though. I don't really like the idea of playing online. And part of me is like, yeah, but realistically, unfortunately, with the way that things are going, this isn't going to be over anytime soon. You know, as much as yeah. everybody kind of hoped, it's like, you know, best case scenario is that things get a little bit more manageable by the summer. But we're not even talking about, like, out of the water. We're talking about just, like, in a situation where the numbers are at least down again. You know, but, you know, it's, yeah, it's going like, to be a long time not... before there's any semblance of normalcy. So, like, getting back together, on, like, you know, on a mass scale, um, I mean, I don't know, unless they come up with a drastically new way of handling things, which is potentially possible, considering what's going to be happening mm -hmm. in the next few days to come. But, you know, I'm just, I'm more, you know, pessimistic unfortunately with how everything is right now you know yeah it's honestly it's ill-advised to meet up in person for like for gaming uh i'm, I'm kind of like you know a pot calling the kettle black here because for my one group we do meet in person but at the same time i work with one of the people in that group and then that person lives with the other three people so we had it's like if any of us would have it, we would all have it, pretty much. It's, I mean, still, I, I get what you're saying, though, but I would still take, you know, precautionary yeah, like, measures if possible, you know what I mean? No, but, of like, course. No, I, so I like, get it. We, we still, like, keep a good, like, fair distance. Like, me being the outsider, I'm always... Let me ask you just one question, just out of curiosity. Do I know any of the people that you're playing with? <sighs> Probably not, because two of them are friends from college. And the other two are their partners. Okay. And I'm not sure if you met my friends from college. Yeah, more I than mean, like pretty much, I think the only people, the only people capacity. I know is some of your high school friends, Sean and then Hanson. Those are probably the only people who I would say that I yeah. know, you know. So, yeah, it, it's not it's not any, any of those guys. Uh, Hanson's still, like, the fact that, like, Hanson's somehow around it sometimes, but also just, like, not... It's just strange, you know. But like, I mean, that... the kids in law school. So I want to, I want to give them like some slack. Uh, from what I hear, law school is pretty intense. <laughs> well, I didn't know he was in law school. But... Yeah, yeah, he's gonna be a lawyer probably because his mom decided for him. But that's a different conversation. <laughs> anyway, but um, well, I actually wanted to ask you a question about something you brought up earlier. Like, not to pivot yeah. super hard from the whole like no, COVID I mean, like, just, you know, it's topic. So you mentioned how you and your group are going to play in an Eberron campaign. And I think I want to spend a little time talking with you about the whole playing in a preset world versus doing your own homebrew thing. Because when I was learning how to do RPGs, uh, we learned from, you know, friend of the show, Chris Conklin. And he had like, all the old school modules and he wouldn't be afraid to bust one out on us every now and again. By and large, we learned to play in your own custom settings, and you would need to figure it out and breathe life into it. When I started hanging out with my college friends who were playing RPGs for some time, they had always played in a pre-written module or a campaign setting. And so when I mentioned to them that I would, like my friends and I would always run stuff that we thought up, they were like very impressed. They were like, oh, wow, it's so crazy that you guys did that. Like, I never thought I could do it. And I'm just like, is well, it hard? Is let me it put scary? it, like, one way. Like, I never just thought to, it Just to give you, like, an idea. Like, let me put it one way just to shine some light on it. It's sure. going to be in the Eberron world or the Eberron setting. <clears throat> it's not necessarily an Eberron, like, campaign. 
What I, and what right. I mean by that is, like, it's not a situation where, oh, we're going to follow a specific module and core adventures. Like, no, I want to use the idea of Eberron where monstrous races are a lot more common. Um, you got steampunk and technology and stuff like that, so it's a little bit more of, like, a more, mm -hmm. you know, modern setting for D&D, &D, but it's not entirely, like, um, all... Uh, you know, like it, it, it's basically just a slightly variation on the fantasy idea. It's almost like Eberron is the yeah. closest thing to what we have been working on. Yeah, but but still, the, the fact that you can apply the Eberron name to it means that if you were going to do this with you know a a, a set of strangers, they would have something to latch onto. But and that can you know, help. That, like I find, I sometimes I mean. find like. Coming up with custom stuff can be hard because it's like, oh, am I going to spend yeah. a ton of time and effort making all this crazy stuff that ultimately the players might not actually utilize, or it's going to like touch up like a very small fa you know, aspect of it, like it's not even going to get that much use mileage if it's like, oh, like we never get past the first town or two, you know? Um, like if you're like, hey, like I want to have a, a preset adventure where I don't have to do a lot of work, I can kind of just run up with my friends. The downside for that is you have to still be able to kind of think on the fly. And yeah. it's like, you know, even like with something like that, you can have a book where it's like, oh, you have to go meet the king. And they're like, well, what if we don't like the king? Or what if we don't want to work with him? And it's like, all right, well, now I have to figure out what to do as opposed to just saying, well, you have to. So, you know. Um, right. I sure. think it's like it's always been player intervention. I think with if <clears throat> using prefab stuff is fine. But, you know, feel free to make your own tweaks and alterations to it, but also at the same time, know that, like, you might have to kind of plan for that, because if at any given point the players have more fun doing something else than what, let's say, the book calls for, you want to kind of go with that, you know? That, that makes sense to me. I think my biggest trouble with playing in a preset world has been the fact that I'm very lazy when it comes to learning about the world and I've always felt like I shouldn't set my game in a place that I don't know about. Because to give you an example, like a couple years back, uh, when Dragon Age, the game was like finally mm -hmm. being released in a full like in a full book, I had I knew some people that were <clears throat> very, very interested in playing it because they had played all the video games, they loved the setting. And they wanted to, like, you know, basically live out one of them in a tabletop. And I volunteered to run it. But I didn't do my due diligence to learn the, the setting. And so when I first started, they just kept poking holes in, in, you know, my descriptions. Like, oh, they wouldn't be there. That's not right. And like, that's, have that's, you difficult. that's that? difficult when you have people who actually know the setting you're talking about. Like, that can be hard. <laughs> Like, but if it's more of those yeah. things of like, oh, we like this this game, and it's like, oh, and I'm gonna make my own little tweaked version of it that's different, you know? Um, yeah. And I think like, yeah, like for example, I bought, I bought Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, like the you know the uh, the last big you know campaign book that came out, because I'm like, oh, that looks cool, and I think I might want to give it a shot. And I'm reading it, I'm like, this is a, just a lot. Like, this is just like a lot just to learn, and I don't even know if they're even gonna like. Like I said, like do any of this stuff, or if I even want to use this whole cloth, um, mm -hmm. so it can be difficult. So it's like, but like it, you kind of should or you need to. Um, some of the things I'm also guilty of myself is I kind of like play with my own way of interpret. Not not like interpreting, but like handling the rules, not realizing there's a lot of stuff in Tasha's and Xanathar's and the DMG guide that covers a lot of the stuff for you, so you don't have to think it up on your own. But instead, I often like. Yeah. Oh, like I need to figure out this. I need to figure out that. Oh, that actually the DMG does a good job of doing that for you. I just don't have the time to sit and read and learn a book. But like, if you're gonna really DM something and you want to do a really good job, you probably should at least familiarize yourself with what tools the book you know provides for you. You know. Yeah. I, again, not to veer off too much, but that's why I've tended to shy away from running 5e games or even like D and D games in general. Just because it feels like there's always a rule for something, and I don't have the book that has it. That way, it works Whereas, in the area, though, there's nothing. To, there's no harm in just coming up with a rule on your own of like, how does something yeah, happen? I, oh, I'll just I'll determine it myself, or I'll figure it out, and then boom, there you go. You know. Yeah, but like, 
I don't know. Uh, so I, I run an into the odd game for my like for my college friends, and the game is like it's a it's a pamphlet. I wish I had the rule book on me right now. No, no, but I think you told me about it before. There's like nothing to it, and essentially, if the characters want to do something in a game that is you know interesting and has consequence, it really just comes down to okay, make a, a roll equal to or less than the relevant stat. Like, whereas I feel like in D&D or Pathfinder or whatever your favorite T20 game is or similar game, whenever a player wants to do something, there's definitely a rule for it. And it's a lot to ask of the DM to be able to readily recall that. And I've had enough experience with players where if you make a ruling and it contradicts an actual rule and they find out about it later, they get a little, you know, salty about it. They get, they get a little miffed. It depends on, like, you know, some people... It, it depends on the player. Like, I thankfully don't play with too many people who are super rules lawyers, but, I mean, I know people who are. And that can be difficult yeah. of, like, oh, like, no, it doesn't work that way. It's like, that's not what the book says. It's like, well, like, I'm just... I'm making a call. Like, I'm making a call on the spot. And it's like, if the, if the book is a rule... And if the rule is a little bit differently, like, you know, that's, you know, maybe that's up to interpretation or that maybe how we might want to handle things. But, like, based on what you're telling me, here's what I think would be a fair way to handle it. Um, and let's go from there. Because, you know, there's a lot of times where, you know, I mean, we were having this conversation maybe off the show about Tasha's and, you know, people yeah. who are looking at it. Oh, here's a good example to kind of bring it back to the idea of world building because it you know because we're kind of talking a lot of general stuff but let's cut but still on the general topic um yeah so dan like i said was doing an everon book an everon game and one of the things he was like is like you know let's do monstrous races and it's like you know come up with some fun and cool and fantastic ideas and of course everybody starts coming up with their own stuff and the, one of the things that i'm doing is trying to come up with stuff that aren't traditional monsters or at least you know things that aren't in the book and he's like i, I don't know like you know like because here's the thing, Tasha's says like, oh, you can have your custom lineage, where all you do is you basically have a plus two modifier to you to one of your stats, you know, okay. you choose either a feed or something else, or skill proficiencies or whatever. So I was like, at first I was like, oh, well, maybe I want to be like, um, I was like, maybe I want to be like a like a like an armadillo guy, you know, because I like the idea of like uh, just like a guy who has his own natural armor that's his skin, and he's digging around, and, and Dan was like. John, the problem with that is that now I have to come up with um, like these this race of people's place in the world that didn't exist before, and how they interact with people, and like what they're viewed upon, and and all this and all that, and that's a lot of extra work for me to have to come up with. And it's like honestly, yeah, I really yeah. don't really know if I want to do that. And then, then I was thinking more towards like a uh, formian, like a like a um, well. So basically, like I had this. I had a couple of kernel of ideas in my head of like what I want to do and what I want to play as. The actual first thing I thought of, which kind of got vetoed down, but you might get a kick out of this, was I wanted to make a god who was so, like, let's just say poorly revered. Not in the sense of like an opinion, but like a lot of his followers kind of died off. So there's only like maybe okay. a handful of people keeping it around. That's the only reason why it is able to manifest a physical form. But I was thinking about, like, it's a paladin, but it worships itself, and it's all about, like, self-actualization of, like, no, you could do this, you could do this, people love you, and respect you, and you're strong, and you're wise, and you are great. God, you made an anime character. And it's like, no, it's like, but yeah, but, like, but meanwhile, it was just like a, it was like a moss that was stuck onto, like, a, like an earth elemental. It was like an earth elemental with, like, a piece of moss stuck in its stomach that was alive, that was a god, that was just like, no, like, I'm... I can do this. I can. I can. I can. I can. I can win. And Dan's like, I'm, I'm one. The gods aren't going to be super around in this world. And two, like I, that's that could be a bit much. Because I was thinking, like, what if he's like jealous at other gods who got better and more accolades? So he, he like, even if he's meeting like, you know, other lesser deities, he's always kind of like making like you know snips at them, of like, yeah. oh, like, how many follow? Like, you know, one of his followers died, but like. You know, but, like, converted at the last moment to a different god, so he didn't even get to, like... He was like, oh, like, I just... Uh. So when that fell through, then I was thinking about the armadillo guy. And then when that fell through, I was like, okay, you know what, then? I want to do a guy who's, like, part of, like, a monstrous union. 
Like, it's a bunch of workers. Okay. They all are, like, banded together for, like, you know, workers' rights and stuff like that. And he's like, first I was thinking of Formian, because they're like ants and they have a hive mind. And he's like, I don't know if that's going to work out. So I'm like, oh, you know, let's go with Goblin. Let's just go Goblin. It's easy, straight up. We'll go with that. So now I have a Goblin monk whose uh, his path is uh, uh, path, of, path of the Astral Self. So it's all like these, like using your mind to make like psychic limbs and stuff like that, or not necessarily like psychic, but like force limbs or whatever. Um, and it's cool because it's like he's not even the head of the union; he's just one of the guys who's in charge. I'm not coming up with like ways of like expanding it, so I'm like, okay, so I'm thinking like maybe he, you know, maybe he's, um, you know, maybe they're part of like a large collected family, and like and the union has like you know like certain members who. You know, just the way that the thing works out, like, you know, he's not in charge, but everybody kind of looks up to him as if he is, but that means that he has to kind of still guide the leadership and you kind of point him in the right direction. And for the most part, like, Dan's like, oh, yeah, that's kind of working. We're kind of liking the idea. And we're feeding off of that, and I'm coming up with other stuff. And I think what I settled on was it's his nephew. His brother was the head of the union. His son, his, his, his nephew, uh, well, okay. My character's brother was the former head of the union. He died in an accident, which could be an accident or not. Like, and that's the fun thing, is it could entirely be just something that was natural, but like everybody thinks it was something else. Um, yeah. And, and the thing of it was, is because of the way that it worked out, his nephew ended up getting the position. And a lot of people like his nephew, and they do respect him, but he's still very green, and figuratively and literally. And... Um, you know, he's trying to, like, learn as much as he can, but because he's also, like, very much trying to get, like, the respect and do what's best for the union as a whole, he might be more susceptible to kind of, like, listen to bad people and, like, kind of fall into, like, more criminal elements that are more common in the world. So my character kind of has to keep him out of trouble and keep him on the right path to make sure that, you know, things don't go south for him, you know? Yeah. And so when Dan, getting back to, you know, it took a long way to get there, but getting back to what I was trying to get at in the initial point, Dan's like, all right, you guys can have some cool stuff. Like, I'm going to give you guys a bunch of stuff. It could be artifacts. It could be weapons. It could be like, I want to give you guys some magical stuff because we're starting at level five. So he was like, at level okay. five, you should have a handful of things you have. And like, some of, one of the things you have could be sidekicks. So I'm like, well, I don't want to necessarily just come up with stuff and then say, all right, Dan, here, here's more characters for you to role play as. But last night we were playing a, a, you know, a couple of video games and we were kind of kicking out some ideas back and forth. And so Dan's like, all right, if you want to do like three sidekicks, like one per each type that's in Tasha's, you've got like an expert, you've got a warrior, and then you have like a prodigy who's like your, your spell cast or whatever. So mm -hmm. one of the things I came up with was like, all right, let's come up with three different, uh, three different sidekicks who I don't take simultaneously. So it's not like I just have, like, a small army with me. It's just like, yeah, maybe, like, depending on the circumstance, I'll call on one of these guys to just come in and help out on a mission and something like that. So one yeah. guy, um, the best part is, is uh, I actually used a, a book that we probably don't touch that often, but uh, you'll get a kick out of this in a bit. Uh, but I flushed these guys out, so it's like, all right, so the, the first guy, the spellcaster, is like, oh, he's a warlock. And at first I was like, oh, it'd be kind of cool if he was, like, dedicated not to, like, a deity, but just more like the general idea of workplace safety. Like, he was like, you know, he was just a big fan of, like, regulation. But Dan's like, no, nah, let's go. He's like, Dan's like, what if he's, like, part of a group of people who all made a pact? Like, you know, maybe it was just one of those things where, like, oh, we need a whole bunch of dudes, and he kind of just got grabbed in. And it's like, all right, your soul is now bound into this creature, and, like, now it, you know, it, has, it gives you power, but it will claim your soul when you die. And... Mm -hmm. Because it's in a union, like, this is me prior to them unionizing. Now that it's in the union, the this character, it's the only one out of the whole other packed group that's still alive. Because it has, like, you know, a health, uh, a safety helmet and a harness and all that stuff. So, like, there's been all kinds of stuff that's happened that's been bad. But he's managed to survive through just, you know, general workplace safety. And the packed creature can't stand it. Because it's like, I have to honor the agreement of empowering you. But I want your soul, and I can't do that if you're still alive. So I'm, so he's both really energetic, really helpful, but also super paranoid because at any given point something could be trying to kill him, so that he can, you know, so his soul will go back to the pack creature. Um, I used the uh, the good 
evil and neutral traits from Secret Fire to actually give him like the different stuff. Um, wow, it, you're bringing up the Secret Fire. It's actually a good thing because it's like you roll on you roll three percentile dice. And it gives you a whole bunch of different stuff that you can kind of fit in. And it doesn't mean your character has to go in that specific direction. Yeah, but it's just a branch of off point. Yeah, the great thing is, real, so we're talking about how no, this no, dude... Just, oh, go ahead. Time out. Real, real quick, real quick. Would you care to explain to the people at home what the secret fire is? Yeah, so we have a French... I don't, uh, I, don't, yeah. I, don't, I don't think of the household name. Well, I've been talking for a while. Why don't you do it? Okay, so the Secret Fire is a role-playing game system written by another friend of the show. Oh, I forget his last name. Uh, George, George Strait. George Strait. Wonderful guy. Uh, big shot Hollywood guy. There's no way he watches this. But, yeah, it's a, it's a new school, like, D&D clone with a lot of old school principles applied to it. You know, it's got this extra currency to it called energy points which allow you to do more things in a scene uh, or like manipulate your roles and stuff but you get energy points by playing your character and like doing what's uh what's, what's right by them in addition he has like uh descriptors tied to each uh each modifier level for for every attribute so and you're meant to you know use those descriptions when you're saying what your character does instead of just saying like okay i hit him with my with my plus two strength it's like ah i use my muscular strength to overwhelm the beast or you know something fun like that i haven't read the book in a while but it's it was unfortunately it came out right when D D clones were flooding the market and it being published pretty much locally to long island i don't think it had much of a chance to get out there it also came out but, before 5e kind of reinvigorated everything yeah yeah there was a so nice it was, it was in that it was in that glut where let's say you know um everything kind of other stuff started flocking up because fourth edition was just so not bad but just a wide departure from what everybody wanted so that people were going into other stuff but at the same time nothing was really sticking 100 percent. so mm -hmm. it had some really cool ideas but yeah the downside was is that like it just had no it was no you know very unlikely to get mass mass appeal yeah i, th I think also oh you know a lot of people I hate to say it, but they, they almost take for granted how big RPGs are as a hobby right now. But back in 2013, when George wrote The Secret Fire, or rather when you know I received my copy, it was a much, much smaller community. Like 5e and stuff like Critical Role really reinvigorated uh, D&D and role-playing and brought it to the mainstream. So, yeah, yeah it, like... It's... It, it's got if something like it's, it's basically like a role playing game written by like an art major, or not a like an English major. So I think like if if he had if if it had, if he had actually waited, and did like a five e supplement of taking a lot of his ideas and saying like oh here's some cool stuff to expand upon your five e game, I think I actually could have done pretty well, you know. Um, yeah, I I think but, it just comes down to you know bad timing because again, he he released it. Uh, basically right before 5e came along not that anyone could have possibly predicted you know what 5e did but you know by the time it was in full swing he was probably working on other projects that were significantly more lucrative well i'm just curious when it actually when did fifth edition come out uh i'm trying to look it up i want to say really 20 quick. i want to say like the summer of 2014 Uh, hold on, D and D five E. So I try to pull it up really quick, just because I'm uh, curious. The player's handbook was August nineteenth, twenty fourteen. Fifth edition monster manual, September thirtieth, twenty fourteen. So two thousand, so, yeah, about about a year or two later. Like he was about a year or so too early to the you know too too early to the party. Um, but anyway, uh, getting back to what I was saying, so like, so yeah, I came up with this character, and like, I came up with these fun things and whatnot. 
And when I rolled up his attributes, it was like he was helpful. Uh, no, in fact, hold on. I have it uh, in an email. I feel like I have to pull up these traits because I have to share them with you because it was just... It nailed the character perfectly. Yeah, like please. When it please works, do. it works amazingly. Um, so, okay. Yeah, so the guy's name was Milford. He is a goblin. He's, uh, you know, his soul was claimed as part of a group pack. He is alone, a sole survivor, thanks entirely to OSHA safety regulations. I, I Right there, I love the implication that OSHA is a concept that exists in the setting. I have to, okay. He's energetic. Oh, but here's the great thing. All right, so check this out. He's energetic. He's an atheist. And he's a backstabber. And so the way that all okay. kind of works together in our head is that, like, okay, he's energetic because he's managed to stay alive despite everything that's happened. He's an atheist because if something so terrible like what happened could happen to him, truly there is no just and loving God that, you know, is watching yeah. over people. And he's backstabbing in the sense of, like, well, like, you know, if people are going to try to get me, i got to get them first. So Naturally. I think it was just, like, something of, like, you know, like, not, but not, like, in an evil way. Like, it's not like he's going to betray the group, but it's, I, the way I thought of it, it was, like, it came to me perfectly. It was like Millhouse. Like, you know, oh, we knocked this tree branch over so we can get across the ravine. Oh, quick, Millhouse, the, the, the branch fell over. Throw another one over. Oh, no, there's no one out of time. I'll get myself to safety. You know? <laughs> or, like, you know, Zap Brannigan or something like that. I think the best thing I said last night was just, like, they were like, oh, no, like, he'll never betray us. He's like, like, no, like, you would do this to me. You would totally stab me in the back. I'm like, no, he wouldn't. He's like, well, prove me wrong. And he does it. So. <laughs> so it's like, you can't be mad at him because it's like, if you do, then you prove him right. So. Oh, my God. But then the other one, yeah, yeah so that, that, was, that was the warlock, quote, unquote. And then the other one was, um, I basically made Scruffy from Futurama. I made the, the expert. It was just like his, like his, his traits came out to being humble, conservative, and unfriendly. And all that's, it was is that like, Scruffy to me, yeah. he, he's not, he doesn't have a good high charisma, but he's very dexterous and he's very intelligent. So it's just like, he's not good at a lot of things and he's very like, you know, gruff. But, like, he's good, so, like, he's like a truck driver. So I actually, I literally gave him land vehicle proficiency because it'd be great to just have a dude who's like, all right, I'm going to get you the way you need to go. And it's like, well, what are you doing? Other like, no, don't talk to me. Like, I'm not, like, look, so I'm not looking So what do you do between adventures? Friends. I sit on the wagon and I, you know, yeah. I just hang out. I mean, if you don't come back, like, I, I won't miss you. I mean, I, I'm, no, I mean, it's not... I'll miss working with you, but not because I'll miss you as a person. I'll just miss having... To, I'll have to learn new names, so... Um, yeah, and then the yeah. absolute best, the best was... I was like, okay, I want to do something that's not a goblin. Because I think it'd just be fun to have something that's not a goblin in the Union. You know, just really like a just an unusual variant or something like that. And we're going back and forth, and like I'm throwing out like class... I Like, not class, monster ideas. Because the way that like... The way that sidekicks work is a sidekick could be anything as long as it is a challenge rating of one half or less so usually okay. you would go with like a human or something like that but if you wanted to go with a different race you technically could so we're flipping through the book yeah. and we're flipping through the book we're trying to find something that works and at first i was like well i kind of like the idea of like a sentient sword like the union just so happens to have like a mystical artifact that like joined it um but begrudgingly and it's like it's now it's part of their but he's like, nah, because one of our friends is going with, like, a, a a warrior who has, like, a sentient weapon. So he's like, I don't want to have to deal with two sentient weapons at the same time. Like, that might be a bit too much. So then we're flipping around. I'm like, oh, here's something cool. Skeletons. Skeletons have a challenge rating of one-fourth. So it's like, all right. So it's like, we're kind of kicking the idea back. And without going into the details, here's what we settled on. Because of the way that Eberron happens, there's this giant, huge zone where this, where the biggest city was, which just exploded. So nobody knows what happened. It was just this crazy explosion, and now there's a zone where nobody could live. A bunch of the Warforge went there because, you know, they technically aren't alive, so whatever kills off living things isn't there. And we're mm -hmm. like, oh, well, what if this skeleton just wandered out of there? And, like, um, I was like, oh, it'd be kind of cool if it was, like, a mishmash of different skeletons. So, like, he could still be, like, a humanoid, but, like, he could have, like, one long, like, on, on arm longer than the others and stuff like that. And Dan's yeah. like, all right, like, what we'll do is he's he's a collective of, he's a collective of bones, but one 
conscious, like a new consciousness. Like it's not like he has amnesia, or it's not like he, you know, it's not like oh, he has multiple people at the same time. No, he like just legit is this new creature that doesn't know, you know, where he was came from, but is only caring about like you know going forward. And he's he's like a, a brick house because he's got a crazy high strength. And um, with the warrior, you get some pretty cool stuff. Like right off the bat, like you can get like a plus two bonus just to straight up attacks and stuff like that. So oh, like wow. he hits really hard. And then when I went with the um, when I went with the secret fire stuff, what I ended up getting was somebody who was um, diplomatic, logical, and power hungry. So the angle that I figured up is pretty much like. He he doesn't have any he, like as a skeleton he has like no charisma, um, which makes That's sense because people are terrified of him you know whatever so like he takes everything in a very smart and precise manner, but because the union like and, and because like they were exhausted and like you know they like no let me rephrase that S skeletons can't get tired they don't need sleep they don't need food so what probably happened was he might have been like constricted to do work for something else. Until the union's like, no, like you deserve fair share. You deserve to be treated right. You know, you deserve to be, you know, valued as a worker. So now the problem was is that he has this this massive now positive sense of self that leads him to believe that he should be always striving for more. Like, no, I so then the next step would be more power. So like, not that he's looking to conquer things and not that he's looking to like be evil, but he's taking the empowerment to the logical conclusion of like, I guess I should just continue to do as much as I can to amass power for both myself and the union. So, you know, Naturally. now, yeah, he's, you know, now he's working in that. Oh, and we needed to have come up with a hobby. So I'm like, Dan, give him this one random hobby. It's like, oh, he's a whittler. He does wood whittling. And I was like, but what does he whittle? And we are going back and forth. It's like, oh, little toy ducks. And like, no, no, no. And I'm like, bones. He only whittles what he knows. So he literally whittles and they're like, and then like, I don't remember if Dan had the idea or if I had the idea. And then, like, he's making copies of himself. Like, he's literally just making copies of himself out of wood. And the thing is, is, like, people constantly get it confused because, like, they, they keep thinking it's him, not realizing that it's not. So, like, one of them will come to life. Oh, hey. And I'm like, ah. But also, like, that's also why his charisma is not that great because he's just having circular conversations with himself because all he keeps doing is practicing on the, on the wooden skeletons. But also, people are super weirded out because, like, he's got, like, a whole army of skeletons, but they don't do anything. But I've seen some of them move sometimes, I swear. And it's like... Yeah, yeah. And this was all just for a campaign thing. But this is the kind of thing, like, world building is all about, of, like, coming up Absolutely. with something really fun and wacky out there and just, like, whipping it up. So now Dan has plenty of stuff he can mine for his campaign of, like, yeah, these are dudes I can just bring along for just, like, a one or two off thing. Um... But it's cool that they have, like, some really awesome motivations or things that could play into either the background or their own little side or, or fun downtime stuff, you know? Yeah, I, I think there's way too much of uh, an emphasis in world building to make everything, you know, make sense and be logical and be meaningful and important. You know, reality isn't always the best example, but things happen in real life that... No, the reason for which can't possibly be discerned. Um, and see, sometimes small decisions that are made offhand end up becoming very large. Uh, in my Into the Odd campaign, for an example, it was towards the end of the session and toward, like for like our second session in, in that campaign. And I was trying to have them be very open-ended with what they could do. However, I knew my group liked to have a little bit of structure. So towards the end of the session, I said, oh, you guys are happening upon a group of cultists bringing food back to their base. And what started off as like a mild description ended up becoming the primary subplot to this campaign right now where they keep interacting with this cult and these cultists and different offshoots and branches of them and just trying to stop them from taking over the world. Because as, as they've seen in their first meeting, this is a cult that has a very real, very plausible end game. And they know that if they let these people not be attended to for long enough, 
shit could get real. Right. And I think, like, the thing about world building, and even if you, like, the best way to describe it is like this. You don't have to go crazy coming up with all kinds of stuff that, again, your characters might not deal with. You always might want to, like, let them kind of give you stuff to grow and advance off of mm -hmm. that can either go in and along with your own ideas or at least as, like, a good use of, you know, taking what they came up with and making them think it was part of the master plan the whole time. But even yeah. if that's the case, like, even if you come up with something small, as long as it has some kind of an impact, it doesn't need to be a story impact, but it could have something that just leaves a memorable impression, that's going to be something your, your characters take away with for a very long time. So, like, if you just whip up an NPC who is just there just to kind of take up a scene or two, and then maybe if the players come back and they see that NPC again, or that NPC shows up somewhere further on the line, like, that's going to stick around, you know? And, like, you yeah. know, it could just simply be, like, oh, they go to talk to a shopkeeper, and the shopkeeper could just be... Just a, an unusual personality quirk or something that makes them stand out. So they're like, all right, like, let's go back to that dude. Or or maybe, you know, maybe they'll want, want to find more about this guy. And maybe it's like, all right, well, I was going to have you get all this information from a town guard. But if you want to just talk to this merchant, yeah, maybe he does know something about this cult that's going on in town. You know what I mean? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's one thing my players have consistently done and i've had to be i've had to be mindful of is they don't act the way i think they will act even when i'm trying very hard to think from their perspectives so i've had to be very ready and willing to change details on the fly and move things around to just like better suit what they're actually doing uh like we had one session uh, like two sessions ago, where they basically began the like the session in the middle of town. They were enemy. They were, they were public enemies, and they were about to get attacked. I thought, okay, they might stick around, see what's up, and try to like you know save their hides. Um, but no, they immediately find a way to disengage and escape, and they're like, okay, we're just gonna ignore that for for a while and you know within the you know fiction of the world i had to move around certain events because i wanted to make sure that the next time they interacted with uh with that place again something specific was going on and happening to kind of drive them forward again so you kind of had to like do some little bit of extra, like almost unfortunately the opposite problem. Well, not opposite problem, but like the opposite situation where because they did something that was not what you were anticipating, you know, something you wanted to happen, you had to kind of drastically change. And as a result, like it no longer, um, you know, no, you know, it, it, it could have it had repercussions and now you have to come up with other stuff yeah. or something you might have already yeah. planned out. It, it basically ended up being a filler session as far as, like, advancing the main plot is concerned. And yet, at the same time, because they ha they took that hard left turn in the beginning, they were able to explore the world on their terms for a good amount of time. Like, they were able to interact more with characters that they had in the past, you know, gain a better sense of who they were, you know, find their own place more and more. Because one thing that's a prominent theme is that they are traveling because there's no real place they can call home. So they're just kind of bouncing between the few like points of contact that they have right now. Because, you know, turns out the place they came from is now a hotspot for, you know, weird activity. So they but continuously check in just to see what's going on. And I kind of, I kind of like that they have this network of locations and characters that they can just move between at a moment's notice. Uh, like when I was setting this game up, I thought, oh, it's gonna be this large, expansive world. They're gonna like have so many opportunities for going new places, trying new things. And I'm, I'm gaining an appreciation for how small the campaign setting is right now and how much they're able to extract out of the relatively few things they've actually been able to do, uh, been able to do. Well, I mean, that's... 
I think like a, another way to look at it this way is to maybe look to see what people are trying to get out of role playing. And I've been listening to a lot mm -hmm. of videos. I've been watching a lot of like Brendan Lee Mulligan with Dimension Twenty, and you know. Oh my uh, God, love Dimension and, Twenty, and, 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 um, love Brendan yeah, Lee Mulligan. Yeah, you know he's great. Yeah. And also like you know he recently interviewed Griffin McElroy, and you know some of his stuff, stuff that he does pretty good. And like there's something that a lot of people don't appreciate with a setting in a much smaller capacity. And what I mean by mm -hmm. that is if you actually take something in a much smaller scale, you make it a much more personal, personable story. No, personal, personal. I don't know, personable. Blah, blah. You make it a much more personal story because it's much more likely that your characters know the people that they're interacting with, or at least they, their characters would know the people that they're interacting with. Yeah. Or their impact would have a much wider result as opposed to like, yeah, we're going to stroll into some random town... And there's some, you know, oh, like, we're going to kill the mayor, and, like, uh, then we'll leave, and the town will be like, ah, uh, but no, it's like, no, like, the dude who, like, you might be having a disagreement with isn't just some random town guard, he's your neighbor, like, you've known him for, like, 20 years, and it's like, mm -hmm. he's arguing, but he's, because it's his job, but also because it's like, no, you're asking him to, like, why would I let you burn down the church? That's a weird thing to ask, buddy, so it's like, yeah. what's going on here? So I think, like, that's something that a lot of people take for granted in that, like, a lot of people focus on these huge, massive, expansive, you know, like, Lord of the Rings-esque world, world-sized things. But it's like, nah, another thing that not a lot of, I'd say, DMs do is just say, no, this is going to be a nice, small setting where, you know, maybe, maybe it's not, a, like, a, a lifetime campaign. Like, maybe not something you do for, like, ten years. But something that you could probably get some pretty decent mileage of, of like, all right, this takes place in the town, and maybe a couple of things in the general proximity, but it's things you would kind of know about. So it's like, all right, you guys are, you know, you're not going to travel too far, or if you do, it's probably some good reasoning for doing so. I had the, when I was at the store, the last campaign I was doing, it was, you know, we, I had created this larger world, you know, with a couple of the other DMs, it was a shared space kind of thing. And I kind of took a little region and I kind of set it upon these smaller locales. So much so that the adventure primarily took place in two distinctive points. One town and then another town. So when the party was typically traveling between one to the other or maybe the surrounding area, it was always something in connection with one of two of those two locations. It was very rarely that they ended up going somewhere different and it didn't really go to too many other towns that wasn't just these two. So it was like, all right, this isn't maybe a huge, you know, continent-spanning thing, but just something in a much smaller region where there's a lot more, you know, intrigue and stuff like that going on that uh, that the players got a lot of good story beats out of, you know? Yeah, and I think to your point, one thing that I'm doing in this campaign to really shift... Uh, my own perception of it is while there is still going to be that element of traveling the world, I'm not going to worry about the small details in between getting to their destination. You know, I think when you're not trying to do a heavy simulationist game, you can just kind of skip to the interesting parts and just say like, yes, it takes X length of time just to make it feel like it's real but you don't need to worry about resource tracking. You don't need to worry about like all the small like little ways you got lost. We can just say, okay, here's the next thing that you'll be facing that I think is meaningful and cool and may help for this the story the way I intend. It may not do that. It may do something different, entirely different. But here's something cool and fun that everyone can now do. And again, like the travel they're going to be doing now is more meaningful, not just, oh, we're going to scour the earth in search of some relics and artifacts. It's, okay, you know where we're going. Let's get to the important parts in that trek. So, like, I'm looking forward to, you know, when Dan starts running his thing on Wednesday, like, I'm, you know, really kind of excited for where we're going to go with that because, um... I, I've kind of mentioned, like, you know, you know, he's like, you're going to probably go on missions. It's probably going to be a lot more focused on, you know, what your character does and who they interact with and stuff like that. But, you know, I because I'm focusing a lot of my, my character's motivations on a much more central, smaller, you know, area to kind of deal with, um, I'm just kind of curious where his story is going to go, you know? So... Yeah. 
and I think I think an important question there that's like again often left unsaid is how much of the story is going to be affected by the actions the players take. I've I've never played in a game like this, but I've heard of stuff where, you know, the game is on rails, and while the players have a limited amount of freedom, they're still following the path the DM set for them. And while I'm sure that can be fun, it sounds a lot less appealing to me than the DM just setting up something and the players kind of deciding what to go from there. Like, again, in my game, I I have my idea of what I want the key events to be. So maybe I am kind of railroading them, but I'm very much letting them decide the pacing, the flow, the things that matter in between all those, like, important beats. <coughs> and like you said, it makes them feel like their decisions really matter. Right. Alright, um, now let me ask you the one last question, because we just have a few minutes left. The one that you're going to start playing in, what are you looking to get out of that, or what would you really like to come about from that one? So I'll be honest, for this one, I am more looking to just reconnect with some older friends and have an excuse every week to hang out with them. Plus the like, actual role-playing side of things? Yeah, yeah, like, I, I know these people well enough to know that I'm going to have fun regardless of whatever the content is or whatever the people play. Like, I, I have a lot of implicit trust in the DM to do his job and for, the, and for my fellow players to do their jobs. So whatever happens, I'm going to have a good time. I just want to, you know, see these friends again. All right. <clears throat> yeah, not the answer you are probably expecting, but, like, you know, I'm not going to, you know, BSU or try to make my intentions unclear like and I think that's important too like not every game needs to be this big exploration in storytelling or world building or character development sometimes this hobby is just about having an excuse to see friends every week two weeks however however often you meet no I, I think that's actually a very good point and that a lot of things that people forget uh or at least or at least because for a lot of people who might get into it they might not get into it with friends they might be getting into it because they like the idea of the hobby um and hopefully they make friends by doing so or at least they make connections with people but yeah some one aspect of it is is the game by its very nature is a social thing yeah so, so I, like, I had a little you know like hiccup things <laughs> i wasn't even trying to be like a dramatic pause so, no, like, you know, sometimes it's just a matter of, like, you know, doing what you enjoy with people you like to spend time with and just having a good time, you know? Um, yeah. And, like, again, it's not that I don't enjoy hanging out with my friends in the other game. It's just that in that game, because, because I'm running it and because of, like, the makeup of that group, I much more look forward to how the events within the game play out versus, like, getting to connect with these people. Right, right. And yeah. I, I, think it, I think it comes down to understanding what your expectation is for each game every time you sit down and what everyone else's ex expectation is, too. All right. Well, um, in terms of, let's say, <laughs> next time, because um, we just uh, just got a couple more minutes left to go. Um, I did spend a little bit of more time writing on a novel, uh, or at least you know putting some effort into it. But it, I'll be honest with you, it's, it's like it was very difficult to do so. I had to kind of like force myself into it because yeah. it's kind of like a homework assignment, you know. Like I, the whole it, idea it of it was oh. is because of what we were doing for the show, I wanted to I wanted to take what we were building and do something grander with it. Uh, the only downside, though, is that, like, you know, we had some ideas we kind of came up together, but not really the whole picture. So, you know, I kind of came up with, like, like a like a three-page, you know, like, chapter, or like a prologue would probably be a better way to put it. Um, and it's kind of, the, the only thing is, like, trying to, like, organize my thoughts into the actual page. And, like, uh, like what I mean by that is I... Because you have to write something and you have to both 
at the same time convey what your character is thinking, convey what they're doing, but also setting stuff up to happen later on in the book. You don't want to. You don't also want to lay everything all out at once either, because then it's like well, you know you just spent in a single paragraph what might end up you know like being you know four or five things down the line that now don't need to happen because you just spelled them all out right there. But yeah. You also don't want to like you don't want to be writing unnecessary words either because you want to have something that's wordy just for the sense of being wordy too. You know. Agreed. So it's sort of like a good balance of like all right, like you know let me delete, delete, delete. You know, retype, retype, retype of like. How's a way to convey how somebody is feeling, what they're trying to do without flat out just stating what they're trying to do, and just get their emotions across, and yeah, I, I think I have some good ideas, I just, I'm not the most literary kind of person, so I think the mm-hmm. downside is, I think I'm much better in like a conceptualizing kind of view, but like getting it onto the actual like, you know, converting it to, to typing like I said, I just don't have the same motivation, so it's hard. But like, if somebody was like, "Hey, every night out of the week, could you just sit down and on a, on a phone call for an hour, just give me story stuff?" Like, yeah, I could probably just belt that out nonstop, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, writing is tough. Um, everyone thinks they can be the next great American novelist, but it's actually very challenging to convey ideas. Oh, you, to convey them in, a good, in an enjoyable and entertaining way. Yeah. Actually, you're right. I'll revise my statement. Writing is easy. Writing well is hard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, like, I think the novel is going to be something that uh, we'll need to figure out a better way to approach it. I think, you know, we definitely need to make an outline for it. And then I think as far as actually writing it is concerned... If we both want to do it, it, it would need to be like we work on separate parts of it or separate chapters and we meet to like discuss how to connect them. But even that I'm not in love with because I, I kind of want there to be one vision driving the narrative. I don't want the chapters to feel desperate. But I think it would also help out. if we had somebody who had some experience already doing some of this or at least like. Even just like somebody who's like an English major who's like, oh, like, here's how you want to do this or here's how you want to do that to like, let's, you know, let's take, I mean, granted, like, I know there's people who come up with stuff all the time who, you know, didn't go to college and stuff for this, but I mean, like, yeah, if I can just come up with something cool and then like, you know, tweak it into something that's actually enjoyable, I'd be happy with that, you know, but yeah, anyway, yeah, it's just about time to wrap up. So let's go over a couple of quick plugs. Um, coming up in February, uh, Long Island Tabletop is bringing you Uplink. Uh, Uplink is the next convention, uh, which is, I'm trying to pull up the details because unfortunately I do not have them memorized. Shame on me. Um, shame, shame, shame. But no, they're going to be running, they're going to be running panels, they're going to be running, uh, games, stuff like that. So it's all going to be, you know, very much enjoyable. Uh, Uplink by Long Island Retro is taking place. Uh, February 20th and the 21st, so we have 32 days to go. The two-day digital extravaganza. Uh, I mean, the last event was awesome. Like, I loved the last digital con that they did, so that's going to be great. Uh, at the same time, this Friday, uh, basically D&D is going to be doing our second game of playing Keep on the Borderlands. Uh, we started uh, two mm-hmm. weeks ago. We did, awesome. we did a, a session one. And this is going to be our second session where we're just starting to explore the caves themselves. So I got to be, got to be much more smarter with my character choices, though. Like I got, I'm, I'm worried about like accidentally getting him killed for doing something stupid. So I got to make sure I pay much closer attention, um, j- especially because it's easy to get distracted when you're not there in person, you know. Absolutely. Jonah, anything that you want to plug? Uh, I will plug. The only actual uh, piece of RPG actual play content that I enjoy, uh, it's this. Uh, it's it's a podcast called Not Another D and D Podcast uh, or Nad Pod for short. It's this group of ex college humor writers and comedians uh, playing D and D five e, and sometimes they do silly things. Oftentimes they do silly things. And it's, I think, very well done. If you like Dimension 20, 
it's a similar group of people. So, you know, I give it two thumbs up. Yeah. Um, with that, um, I think we're going to call it a night. Uh, thank you so much for anybody who joins us or catches us in the future. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of all the stuff that Long Island Tabletop does. And uh, with everything that's going on out there, be safe, be careful, and take care of yourselves. Just be good to each other. <laughs> just, just be good. All right. And...